It's your resource for spending money you shouldn't on things you don't need. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Eliminating CRTs. The quick fox jumped over the snazzy 8-bit do. And swivel on it. These stories and more from bold middle-aged men coming up on today's show. Up-to-date news for out-of-date tech. Hello, chaps. Welcome to another week for This Week in Retro. Hello to everyone listening. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're enjoying your Saturday mornings or indeed whenever it is that you choose to listen to us. Um, It is the summer holidays here in the UK, so the schools are are broken up for the summer holidays, which means uh, I'm I'm taking a little break this week, which is nice. Um, Mm. I say it's nice every single day, as I was telling you before we started recording, has now been filled with things to keep me busy. Well, I just want to sit back in my chair and read a book, but that's just the way it is, isn't it? Um, but in terms of the kids' summer holidays, we're having two-hour kids' game sessions with full access to the cave, full access to the arcade, all at once for a reduced price. First one was on Friday, and it was super popular, in part, I think, because I added challenges. So we had speed runs on Sonic, high score challenges, things like that. Who knew? Who knew kids were so competitive? <laughs> <laughs> It went down really well. So we'll be doing more of that again uh, for the coming Fridays. Um, that's been my week. Yeah. How about you guys? Um, Chris, what have you been up to? Um, week was fairly – well, actually, week was terrible because I was trying to get back in sync with Australia time, which wasn't going well. Um, but the weekend was fantastic. So there was a thing on in Perth called Pixel Expo at the Perth Conference and Exhibition Centre. Uh, and Perth and the Perth Amiga Users Group, it kind of got invited. We're still not sure how or why, but we got invited to just display some stuff and we were – I don't know if I can say. Can I say that? I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the area we were given, we, we weren't charged for as far as far as I'm a, uh, I'm aware, which is fantastic. So we just had like about four tables worth, um, and we just displayed some Amigas, obviously, and some old machines. And um, is you know, that because you were throwing your weight around your celebrity status? I'm not no, it was <laughs> nothing to do with me. No, one of the other admins got contacted. And, and, the, and the whole exhibition isn't, or the whole expo, um, isn't retro-focused at all, really. It's all about modern gaming, indie developers. So it's a platform for them to, to show their wares. There's some really good stuff being shown. Um, and also, as with everything these days, a cosplay competition. No, I was not involved in that. Um, and all sorts of, you know, sort of for sale booths and, and that kind of thing. But the area they put us in worked really well because it was next to Murdoch University and they'd set up a heap of consoles and that was everything from, you know, the SNES all the way up through to the PS5 and everything in between um, just as a free, free play area for people to come and play on. And so we were the other side of that. So people naturally progressed through that and then were coming over and going, oh, wow, look at this old machine. And it was people of all ages and really encouraging to see even kids going, at first going, hey, this looks a bit weird. But then on my A1200, for example, I had Gloom Deluxe running and they were loving it. You know, they thought they were playing Doom, some of them. I didn't want to ruin it for them and tell no, them they it didn't, wasn't. Chris. They it didn't wasn't. think they were no, playing ser- Doom. Seriously, on <laughs> seriously a couple, of them, a couple <laughs> of them were like, oh, yeah, this is Doom, I think. And then they're playing it. And I'm thinking, it's not Doom, but I don't know if I should say anything. <laughs> but And then, you know, a couple of conversations and just explaining where in, in terms of time these machines fit and, and then, you know, telling them what the spec was and, and that kind of thing. So it was really cool. You know when kids tell their grandparents what they think they want their grandparents to hear just uh, so they don't upset them. <laughs> that's what, that's, that's what was going on there, Chris. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe they knew the whole backstory. They're like, let's rip this guy and say, oh, it must be Doom. Oh, no, wait, it can't be. It's an Amiga. <laughs> just as it good as Doom. Yes, it is, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny, isn't it, how, how cosplay is associated with retro game events because I see that happen mm. quite a lot. And you have sort of a cosplay parade at the end of a retro yeah they had a whole competition um you know i've i've done it in the past but it was at a comic con which is perhaps where you might expect it i haven't done it regularly Mm. i dressed up as bane once from batman and had some fun nice but i don't associate it with retro computers i don't know why that is maybe it's just i don't know dave you cosplay every weekend maybe you can explain no i i don't i don't really understand that i guess it's maybe something that the people who are into console gate, I think it's a, a ten years old, ten years younger than us thing. People who are into console gaming were also into comics and anime and all the rest mm. of it, and that kind of kind of all fits together a little bit. 
Yeah, I guess like if I said, you're presenting this wasn't the, the expo as a as a cultural show that covers all of those topics, fine. But I have seen it at just a computer show, which I found a yeah. bit odd. I don't, I don't yeah. really get that, but um, yeah, like I said, it, it wasn't it wasn't a retro expo. It was it had retro elements, but it was like I said, more modern as well, mm. and and you know, current just the elephant's developers. graveyard at the back with you guys in it. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> a place for people to lose their kids while they went off and did other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, it was great. It was a fantastic weekend. Yes, yeah, so that's myself. Dave? I have got myself a scan doubler for my Amiga 1200 Checkmate build. I've got myself a, a case for my floppy Tower of Power. Hoffman sending me a three-inch drive I was missing, and my 1200 is getting picked up today to get recaps. So everything's moving in those projects. I'm quite excited. It's all, it's all plowing on ahead. Um, hopefully, man. I'm going to have um, an amazing device that allows me to write any floppy disk I want. And I'm going to have my, my Amiga, um, which I, I hope to finish off and then not spend. I see so many Amiga people making changes all the time to theirs. I'm hopefully not going to have to nah. do that. Once it's there, it's there. You don't need to. Well, I haven't changed that. anything on mine. Nah. Once it's there, yeah. once you've got everything you want in WHD load setup, maybe a launcher to launch your games. You know, no. that, you've got the history of the Amiga all mm. wrapped up in that setup. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not going to have a launcher. I'm not. I don't want to have a great big library of WHD load games there. I want to install everything as and when I want to play it. Nice. Um, and I want to have a, a modest hard disk. I'm thinking 256 megabytes hard disk. I, I want to try and keep it as as authentic feeling as I can for what I would have had had I gone Amiga instead of... There was no chance of me going Amiga instead of PC, but had I gone Amiga mm. instead of PC, I would have had the 1200. I would have put a hard disk in and I would have got everything um, installed and uh, in that way. So that's what I want to do rather than well, just the, yeah. the emulated experience. It'd be interesting to see how that experience evolves for you because I've yeah. got to the point now where I do have all the games on the Amiga, but I have them in a folder called All Games and then I have another folder called Curated and it's only the Curated that show up in my that's launcher. Yeah. That, that, that um, sounds right to me. And when somebody came in just this weekend um, and said, have you got R... <laughs> for the Amiga, have you seen that? It's like A A A A A R G H exclamation mark. A 1988 it's game. It's about like Godzilla smashing up houses and eating little people no, uh, in a that. rampage style game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, I've never played it, but it must be there because I've got all the games. So I just dragged it over to the curated folder and there it was and they could enjoy it. So. Yeah, I think I'd, I've got a PCMCIA adapter for CF cards for the Amiga. So mm. I might end up with a CF card with all of WHD load on that. And it means that if I want to, I can go and get a game from that. But I, I don't mm. want to just have, turn it on and be presented a list of games. It, it, it makes it feel a bit thin. It makes it feel a bit unauthentic. Fair mm. enough. We'll see. If, if you're into installing games, you do you, Dave. We'll see how we go. And I can, I can always change my mind. Go along the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do what I do and have two, one with everything on and one that's the pure install. doesn't even have WHD load. Any games that are on there are installed because they were installable back in, you know, 1992, three, yeah. whenever. Often from the final floppy disk, you've got to find the installer on like disk eight. Yes, that's um, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll come on to housekeeping shortly. I did just want to mention one other thing that I saw pop up this morning, which is Fractal Design, who make cases you may be familiar with. I've owned a Fractal Design case in the past. They've just launched a series of white and black cases with gorgeous looks like wood veneer fronts um almost looks like wood baffling you know sound deadening lots of little strips of wood on the front of their case Mm. uh with a definite atari 2600 vibe to it and i think it looks gorgeous so could this be the beginning of the return of wood grain or wood in modern tech Mm. i like them i like certainly looks good Mm. um i think i think Duncan, yes, Duncan did. Producer Duncan submitted this to the subreddit and it didn't catch on as a story, but I particularly liked it. Um, I've for, for a while now, I've liked the Atari XL design. I've liked the way that the Atari XL looks. There was three particular uh, models for that and we covered what was looking to be a remake of one of those, the XL one. And I particularly like that look. And I guess maybe it's coming back into fashion because mm. they must have stepped away from it 
in the they must have stepped away from it in the early eighties and said, no, no, we need we need to make everything all white and beige and uh, and clean lines rather than this rather than this particular kind of wood look to it. They must have mm-hmm. stepped away. It must be coming back into fashion because I'm looking at that and thinking that looks great. It really does look good. It does, and if wood's coming back, that means we're just one step away now from beige. That will be the next step again from the seventies wood to the eighties and nineties beige. Bring beige is nice. Beige we're all going to buy nice. one. You know, as soon as beige PC cases come back out, we're all going to buy one, 100%. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Dave, take us into the housekeeping. We talked about the Dolphin emulator a few episodes back and from really interesting comments on that. Um, and now it appears that the standoff have um, this, the standoff between Dolphin and um, uh, Steam and uh, Nintendo has kind of ended up sitting where it was more or less what, what we thought it was going to be. Um, Dolphin have clarified that there wasn't a DCMA or DMCA, whatever it is, take down notice issue. There was not one of those issued. Although Nintendo spoke to Steam and said, don't put this on without our permission, which fundamentally is the same thing. Um, I don't think it's really any functionally any different. So Dolphin are not going to do the... Um, not going to appear on Steam. They, they, they don't fight, think there's any way they'll be able to get um, Nintendo to agree to um, to them coming on Steam. So it's going to be that standoff. Now, this is what I, I, I guess I thought was going to happen. Um, Nintendo don't want to go to court to argue the legality of Dolphin because they may lose. And Dolphin can't afford to go to court to... Um, to to, to put it on Steam, they would rather say, "Okay, we, we risk losing everything, so we'll we'll not gamble." So Nintendo, I guess the the win for Nintendo is that the emulator doesn't become mainstream and super easy to install, and the win for Dolphin is they still get to exist, and with a little bit of um, a little bit of know how, you can download the emulator, you can get the ROMs for it, and you can use it in that way. So this is, I guess, what we expected, and that means that. Uh, Dolphin is not going to go quite mainstream in the way that we expected. Any comments, guys? No, I mean, it's it's, it's the usual pattern, isn't it? Nintendo threatened to throw their weight around in the hope that people get scared, and that's the end of that. Um, Mm. (laughs) Here we are, another example of Nintendo throwing their weight around, Um, but not taking it to the conclusion, like you say, in, in fear that it will set a precedent. No surprises, Dave. No, no, no surprises. I think it's the end of this this that story as well. That's the that's as far as it'll go. I mean, if you want to use Dolphin, there's nothing at all stopping you other than you can't just hit a button on your Steam Deck and start playing Wii games. It's not Wii, is it? It is Wii, is it? It's Wii, yeah. Wii and GameCube. Did I get that right? Neil, help me out here. Um. Yes, yes, that's Could right. You? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Scared there for a second. The comments. <laughs> Dave, it's Sega. Um, yeah. We, as I'm sure people will know, have a Patreon campaign. And someone in you has signed up. So thank you very much, Mark, for signing up to us, becoming a patron on Patreon for us. If you'd like to join Mark and a number of other kind people who help us contribute towards the cost of running this, then you can go to www.patreon.com slash thisweekinretro. The ticking time bomb of retro is, and has been for a long time, the death of the CRT. A CRT TV or monitor is the only way to experience vintage machines in a 100% accurate setting. But alternatives have now got so good that they are enough to satisfy many people. And of course, some people simply don't care. They live in a timeline where flat screens came along and it wasn't a step back. It was just an upgrade. They carried on using their machines. They upgraded their screens and they're perfectly happy with that. And there's nothing wrong with that either. However you use your machine is fine. Now, I've been seeing news pop up recently on X, not Twitter, X, and also Twitter. Threads. 
Mastodon, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere else, <laughs> post updates. I've really got to have a cull of all the social platforms that I use because it's just getting silly now. Um, but I've seen news pop up on all of these about the RetroTINK 4K. Uh, this is incoming. It has an announced price tag of about $1,000. So it really is a premium product. But if past products are anything to go by from RetroTINK, it's going to be a good one, no doubt. Um, but I also saw this news thanks to an article submitted by regular listener Dr. Local to our subreddit. Thank you. It's a new product in the works called the CRT Eliminator, and it's here to serve a niche audience. And that's what we like best. Crazy ideas built because someone wants it to exist that might just happen to, uh, to serve others too. The CRT Eliminator is built for classic PC owners who use an ISA video card or ISA, as Dave says. Uh, and those those video cards also need to have a feature connector on the card. So um, just to explain what that is, if you've ever used, for example, a full motion video card on a vintage PC of a certain era, you might recall that you put your FMV card in. Internally, you connect the FMV card to your video card using a ribbon cable. Um, there are different types of feature connectors as well, just to confuse things. But you have a feature connector from your FMV card to your video card. The video card then sends its regular output to the FMV card, which mixes it in with the hardware-assisted M MPEG video, now decoded, and it spits it all out to your monitor. So you can enjoy Return to Zork and a select few other games that supported your FMV card that cost you several hundred pounds. Um, before I go on, did you guys ever have FMV cards? No, I'm too poor to ever have one. Yeah, no, yeah. no way. I remember I, I'd always see the adverts in my PC magazine and think that looks incredible, but a couple of hundred pounds at least for the card. It was a lot of money. Um, by, the time, by the time I got a, a CD drive, they weren't really necessary. Graphics cards are kind of – they were like remember, remember physics cards? Yeah. Physics cards yeah, I, existed, yeah. and then all of a sudden they were the graphics card. like, no, 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 let's borg that up. And that was the end of them. Same yeah. idea. So um, the, the CR, oh, Chris, you've never had one either? No, no, no. I said no. Yeah. Have you I played with know. one in the modern day? Have you ever used one, an expo or anything like that? No, no, no not at all. No, I want one. No. Thank no. you. I'll be an eBay later on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a nice way to experience that kind of thing is, is perhaps through the CDI with the FMV module. I've been playing a lot of Seventh Guest lately in that way, and that's quite nice. Oh, the, the Amiga, um, the Amiga CD32 is one, or is it a CD TV? That's got one? a module as well, and it's supported yeah. by Cannon Fodder, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because all the FMV in game is is great for that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, back to this story, the CRT Eliminator. It takes advantage of the feature connector. So you plug the Eliminator into your PC like any other expansion card, connect the ribbon cable up to your video card, and then the Eliminator will spit out crisp, upscaled DVD D video signals. It's the work of Ian Hanschen, who um, lists all of its features over on oummg.com and that link and any others that we discuss will be in the show notes today and it includes support for example up to 800 by 600 svga input going into it um, you can also output from your old video cards vga port at the same time so that would make it great for a system for capturing or for streaming from original hardware while you're sat looking at and playing on a crt for example if that's what you want it supports all the resolutions and refresh rates that you can need, as well as sporting some neat zero lag features, which are all explained on the website. And of course, no drivers are needed because it's not actually doing anything with your PC. It's just drawing power from the PC. Um, the PC doesn't know it exists. It's just passing video through and then it comes out the back. So there you go. You get the idea about what the Eliminator is. Um, it's not on sale yet. It should be later this year with an expected price tag quoted of 200 euros. And I think um, looking over at the main attraction for me probably is that dual output capability for streaming or capture because I am still very attached to my CRTs, but also it'd be really fun to set up a vintage PC and have big screen output. So a modern projector or a 50 inch TV with Monkey Island on or something like that. Um, so people can enjoy that real hardware on a massive screen. There are many other ways of achieving this as well, you know, um, an A500 Mini, for example, with its HDMI output, a buy, a mister. There are loads of ways of doing this, but if you want to use the original hardware, it's a nice option. 
um i can see it being used at an expo maybe a gigantic screen for an audience with some original hardware anyway it exists it's a thing the eliminator what do you guys make of it can you be persuaded by something like this away from your crts dave absolutely not no uh, no <laughs> surprise um chris not not by this time. no the I should point out that this is, it's it's not a fundamentally new concept. Uh, I picked a bit of a grand name for it, the CRT Eliminator. Um, yeah. Neil? Can I just say, when I first read the name, my immediate reaction was, oh, there's some CRT alternatives that's come up, yes. been come up with. Yeah. Not yeah. the product that it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't expecting the product that I saw. Uh, so the idea of hooking on, to the digital signal inside the computer, because that's what this does. All all computers work in digital. Well, I shouldn't have said that. Um, the computers that we think of work in digital. Um, <laughs> oh, no, the comments. There are examples with that aren't. Uh, but for the most part, they work in digital, and they then convert that digital signal to analog to go to the CRT. And if you're not using a CRT, you're converting from digital to analog to only then convert back from analog to put it onto a digital screen. So what this does is it cuts out the, the to and from step, and it, it plugs into the signals within the computer, and you get a much cleaner signal. But it's not a new thing. It's been done for a while. Flicker fixers and scan doublers for the Amiga, for example. There's the, the RGB output from Copper Dragon C64 Video Enhancer. Loads of HDMI mods for computers work inside the computer, and that's what they're doing. They're picking up the signal internally, and they're, they're turning that into the, the HDMI or DVID signal without having to go to analog first, Neil. Yeah, I guess a similar project is the Pi-based um, RGB project that can sit inside yeah. an Amiga. There's, mm -hmm. there's one that goes in the Amiga 2000 video slot, which is really yeah. neat. You can get from places like Retro Rewind or um, possibly Amiga Passion. I'm not sure if they sell it as well. Um, but yeah, a similar similar concept. I guess the difference is using that feature connector, you're getting a, yeah, clever. a very, it. very clean signal. Yes, yeah, because um, yeah. it's coming from the video card itself, so it's good. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to. I don't imagine how you can improve on that at all. But it is a good idea. So uh, that that's the knocking out of the way. It's a good idea because when you uh, when you drop down from using a CRT, you lose the nice things, and these are the nice things that Neil and I were thinking about when we heard the, the name CRT eliminated. We thought these nice things were going to be replicated in some way, and by that mean a way, the effect that CRTs have almost dithering the image um, and the persistence and the contrast and the brightness and the dark levels, all those things that we're used to with a CRT that you lose, you lose those, but you also lose things like the image quality because you get jail bars, you get other weirdness appearing when you go to digital that you don't really see in a CRT. And that's what this is aimed at. It's aimed at making sure that you start off with a clean signal before you get somewhere else. Now, we will need to get rid of CRTs in the future. And when I say we, I don't include Neil because I'm sure Neil will somehow <laughs> manage to keep those going. It's, it's, it's your job to do it in the museum for as long as is possible. There are some people, I haven't got all the details. Uh, I'll have to look them up for Duncan to put in the show notes. But we were just casually discussing in the workshop last week. Apparently, there's um, a company in the US that has started regassing crts so old tubes because mm -hmm. once you knock the back of them and the gas you know the vacuum's lost that's the end of them apparently they're uh, regassing resealing them up and, and making them usable again which is oh, just good. one step away from blowing a glass tube and, and making a completely new crt so um interesting what something to look out for my, my understanding is that to, to make new crts requires a massive investment, a massive, massive, couldn't happen style investment. But if of the the hundreds of millions of CRTs that existed in the 80s and 90s, if that filters down to just the few that are needed for retro enthusiasts and museums and so on, so that we can have enough to go around and so that they can be maintained, then perhaps we'll have them. But I think for many of us who currently use CRTs, for many of us at least, that will have to go. And I think it might be welcome to go when we have some of the replacements that are already there. For example, 
you have Stephen Jones's Checkmate monitor, which is set to replicate some of the features of the CRT, mostly in how it appears. There's, you get devices to add scan lines. We've talked about the retro tink and so on. They do that. I don't like the scan lines, uh, but um, there are other things they add on, the kind of glow and the kind of effect of it. Um, there's a retro virtual machine mon- um, emulator for the CPC and, and Spectrum that does a few CRT-style t- uh, things. Um, OLED screens, though, the, the contrast you get in OLED screens is incredible. So for me, excuse me, Dot, thank you very much. My cat Sorry, is Dot, interfering Dot's with the against the, uh, the, <laughs> the microphone there for anyone who's hearing knocks and bumps. Um Dot the kitten. Um, so there, there are moves being made there. And the important thing, going back to this story, is the important thing is if you start out with a damaged and impaired signal, then you can't get the great output we're looking for. So this will be devices like this will be the vital first step in a great um, non CRT signal that we might be happier than, than, than we would be with a CRT. Yeah, see, I I am a fan of the scan line, um, and that's where products like the RetroTink and the and the four K RetroTink that's been that's coming out soon um, really do interest me because they've got so many options to try and not only scale it up but also keep that feel. Add the scan lines, add the um, the aperture masks, and you know all of that kind of thing to get that effect. It's the other things that I like: the the brightness, the glow of the CRT, mm. the way that things dither on it. Um, and the way that things are a little bit of persistence. In fact, we talked about it last week when we talked about Pac-Man. We talked mm. about how it only drew one ghost at a time, but that was enough to get you kind of a pulsing ghost on the screen that you didn't realise what they were doing. Chasing, erasing the beam, as it was called. Um, yes. <laughs> Chris, tell us your thoughts. Uh, I'd have to see it in action in the flesh. I'm not sure that I'm really the sort of target audience or have a use case for it. Um, I shamelessly use flat screens anyway. Um, and yeah. funnily enough, with regard to PCs, go on, Neil, sorry. When you say you'd have to see it in action, I mean, all you have to do is run an emulator on a modern PC. and, and Oh, and that's what it's going to look like. screen is what it's going to yeah. look like, isn't it? It's yeah. just going to be an HDMI output yeah. on a flat screen. Yeah. Uh, and the only machine I've noticed things like jail bars on was the 386 that I had. Um, well, I've still got... Um, and I didn't notice them when I first set it up. It was just like, oh, cool, I'm playing on a 386 again on a flat screen. And then it was a couple of days later when I, I was trying something else out, and I thought, hang on, where are those lines come from? Has something gone wrong? And then realised, no, they would have been there the first time I looked at it. That's jail bars, and that's the first time I noticed it. It's not It's not the end of the world. And then I didn't care. Yeah, exactly. As soon as I realised what was going on, I, I actually didn't care. But that said, um, at the expo, at Pixel Expo, um, I was lucky enough. So Dave, the other guy that was there for most of the weekend with me, um, I he, wasn't. he'd no it was another dave in fact he prefers <laughs> david i don't know if you prefer david but anyway yep. um Steve. but anyway dave from the perth amiga users group he actually took a crt along which i was able to hook up to my a1200 uh and keep in mind i've got to go through workbench to launch the games that were installed on the hard disk and i was actually really impressed with the quality of the crt keeping in mind i, I didn't ha- it wasn't a scart one so i wasn't using rgb to scart this was just composite and the image clarity, and it was. I think the key thing was as well, it was a small CRT. It was about 10 inches, I think. Um, whereas you blow it up, the only CRT I've got is about a 22-inch, and you, you plug it on, on that, and it looks hideous. Um, and the flicker gives you a migraine within five minutes, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas the small screens, which is what we had in our bedrooms anyway, and especially if you're talking about PCs, the monitors are small, then then I start to understand that actually they look really bright, they look really clear, and there is something special about that image. But, yeah, not something I'm fussed about, to be honest. Yep. I'm just waiting for somebody to invent something that makes the N64 look good on a flat screen because I don't know what it is about that console, but it just it just needs a CRT is the polite way of putting it. It might that's be the interlace uh, thing, I'm not sure. That's one where yeah. emulation really does help with the uh, the output of the N64, doesn't it, on a modern display? <laughs> you lot, I think um, you need a lot of footing with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, the uh, other product on the Amiga I was trying to remember earlier is the RGB to HDMI, uh, and it is indeed available at uh, Retro Passion and also Retro Rewind. So plenty of places you can get that from <clears throat> if you can get the Pi to go with it, um, which are I believe the Pies are becoming a lot more readily available again yeah. now. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not so an issue. That's really nice to see them coming back on stream. Um, there's also the RetroTINK 4K to look up and find out about that. And then this is the CRT Eliminator. So all links 
in the show notes. Thank you, Duncan, for putting them in. And of course, as always, thank you, Duncan, for everything you do in editing this show up uh, and making it enjoyable, hopefully, for people uh, to listen to and also use as a resource by following those links or by visiting reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro, where you can submit these stories for us to discuss or just chat amongst yourselves. And we also have our Discord Discord server discord.gg forward slash rmc retro where we have a dedicated uh this week in retro room and all of the other rooms you can break out into and chat so come and chat to us there um ask dave what dot's up to talk to chris about uh whatever chris does if it is week chris <laughs> buys games chris buys a nice games. video out on the games he's brought back to australia from the civilized world yes we are sponsored by pixel addict daily magazine that comes out every six weeks uh pixel addict is a the concept a digital lifestyle magazine which means they cover a wide gamut of games but other related things like uh, from the, around that time neil correct is, me i was just gonna say david would you consider yourself to have a digital lifestyle or an analog lifestyle <laughs> Ooh, digital, digital 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 yeah can, yeah digital yeah I don't know if there Digital, is a magazine yeah. that caters for those who have an analog lifestyle. I think an analog lifestyle would be things like eight tracks and vinyl records and wood green and Crocs. Yeah, not much Crocs. Crocs are digital. Crocs are digital. Oh, are they? I guess yeah. they're either on or off. I, I, I wear Crocs about the house, and Neil, <laughs> Neil mocks me relentlessly. He's almost like he's almost like he's ashamed of it, and he's trying to convince me to change. I will not change out my Crocs. I like Crocs. Crocs are. Crocs are really comfy. If I went to go out in the garden, I just step out of the house into the garden. I'm fine. Uh, I wouldn't do that with slippers on. You're well, the person wearing them. Okay. Yeah, but we're not, not sponsored Crocs. by Crocs. Crocs. We're not sponsored. We'd like to be sponsored by Crocs. Never mind Pixel Addict Magazine. Let's borrow from Crocs. I have been reading Pixel Addict Magazine. Mm-hmm. I've been reading the final part in Tom's BBC series, little mini series. I really enjoyed reading that. I'm trying not to think about getting the BBC to do it up because I've got too many projects going. I'm also trying to read more than watch YouTube or read as well as watching YouTube because I enjoy the contrast of reading as well as watching on YouTube. I enjoy both better. Um, So it's nice to sit down and read something like that. Um, And there's a nice Jumpstart article on Prince of Persia. So the idea there is it gets you you into playing the game. It's an introduction on how to play the game because – Back in the day, we had all the time in the world to get into these games, but these days it's more difficult to pick up a game and start playing. So read this article, it'll get you start playing, get you over that initial gap and let you start playing. Prince of Persia is a game that I often go back to. I don't mm. know why. It, it just draws me back. Um, it is a pick-up-and-play game. I know it's, it's got a lot of depth if you do want to play through and mm. try and complete it in the 60-minute the time limit. Um, and I have had people in the cave show me tips and tricks, for example... Someone came in recently and showed me how you could circumvent the first enemy and get to the second level without even going to get the sword. You just kind of did a big loop, ran, got round the back of the first enemy, ran past them, and then when you go to the second level, you automatically have the sword because it assumes oh. you would have picked it up to get past it. So there are a lot of tricks. Um, I don't know if there's a speed running competition on Prince of Persia, but maybe I need to, to read this. Um, here. Yeah. yeah, maybe I need to read this article to really get me started properly. And I have been watching Prince of Persia on uh, eBay for a long time because it's got that beautiful kind of triangular, double triangle box. Mm, and it's great. like 200, 250 quid to get hold of. Ugh, far too rich for my Maybe blood, one day it'll be a donation. One day it'll be in a box. Mm. No, I, I think people know what they've got. Or it's the kind of box that just gets crushed. You know, one of those games. Huh. Yeah. Because it's just a weird shape. Anyway, what isn't a weird shape, Dave? Is the shape of Pixel Addict magazine? <laughs> no, it, it's the shape you would want a magazine to be. It is rectangular. Um, it's available in your newsagent along with other rectangular publications. Yeah, on the shelves. Um, it is nice to be able to walk into shop and pick up off the shelf. Chris, you talked about last week, uh, but you can also order it online to be delivered through your letterbox, and it is shaped so that it will go through a letterbox. And you can also get it as a PDF file. Uh, and it comes in the same shape in a PDF file, although yeah. digitally rather than an analog format. Mm. Um, so go to the website, Chris. Pixel.addict.media. And there you can buy it, subscribe. 
there you go. Don't Thank be you, a Pixel square. Addict. Read Pixel Addict be magazine. Be yeah. <laughs> a rectangle. I like using a nice keyboard. In fact, I get frustrated when trying to type on a bad one. And my addiction started way back when my dad used to come home with IBM Model M's that were to be thrown out of the office. I went through several of them. In fact, it was easier just to throw it out than get a, and get a new one than it was to clean it. I mean, they're, they're not worth anything now, are they, surely? Um, I've just heard I've just heard the sound of Clint screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's true as well. They would get dirty. I'll just toss this out and use a new one. <laughs> they, 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 they had boxes and boxes of them, so there was, there, there's no value. I've just heard the sound um, of Clint jumping off a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have moved on to Cherry MX Brown, and while I'm certain there'll be other other uh, key uh, switches out there that are slightly better than that, I've not really got any real interest in finding them or adjusting what I have because I, I'm used to these. They work great. I'm happy enough with them on my main PC and on my work PC in the home office. Um, however, I have noticed people talking about kale box switches, and that's where this article submitted by both Pajaco and Dr. Local comes in. 8-Bit Do have announced their own keyboard. It's a reduced 87-key keyboard, so it's missing the numeric keypad. And it has Kale Box White V2 switches in it. Now, mechanical keyboards are common these days, and they're often, in fact, maybe even usually coming with 87 keys. Now, it seems to be the style these days to, to take off that numeric keypad that's so useful to me. Um, um, Amiga 600 this- is such a trendsetter. Mind you, before that, you know, the ZX Spectrum didn't have one. Yeah, the ZX Spectrum, yeah. The Auric, the, you know. Acorn Electron, BBC. Electron, BBC. But the numeric BBC keypad. Master had for, one. Oh, did it? Mike, did the BBC Mike Rich Ray? Kids. can't remember. If you play a dungeon crawler, then the and numeric the keypad Mike is ideal for it. So basically, we grew up with systems that didn't have numeric keypads. It wasn't, no. it wasn't unusual not to have a numeric keypad. Well, I'm sure I've had it. Yeah. Yeah, my. That's because it, it. it was a business machine. That's why. Yeah. Part of why it's so so wide. Spectrum but, um, didn't. Yeah, there's plenty that no. didn't. Anyway, what's well, your point, Dave? <laughs> there are, this keyboard would be unremarkable if it wasn't for these five interesting things that I've picked out. So first of all, it's relatively inexpensive. Both options are selling for 99 US dollars, and that's a fair enough price for decent switches. You can get them cheaper, but it's with questionable switches. Neil? Do we know if we're going to get a fair exchange rate, or is it just going to be 99 pounds? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Go on, tell me. Keeping me in suspense. I'll come to that. You can get cheaper keyboards than that with questionable switches, or sometimes they're listed as mechanical keyboards and they're not mechanical keyboards from these less than reputable Chinese direct sellers with looking to sell you a keyboard that functions. They say like a mechanical keyboard, but it's not. So if you want something like this, then you have to pay around that price. Now, secondly, it comes from 8-Bit Do, and they've got a pretty good reputation for making no-nonsense wireless and wire, wired game controllers. They seem to be having that. They seem to, in the microcomputer world, we don't have that much of a market, so things are expensive, but in the console enthusiast world, there seems to be a much bigger market, and they can mass-produce these things and really get the price down, and that's what 8-Bit Do seems to do. They, I've got a couple of their controllers. They're, they're Sega kind of kidney bean-shaped ones, and they're really good. They, they work well. They feel good. They weren't expensive. They're, they're no lag on them. They've also done a fight stick. And if you're um, not from, born in 1995 onwards, what a fight stick is, it's just an arcade-style controller uh, stick in, a, in a, a, a large enough thing that sits flat uh, with about six or more buttons. There's nice, nice low latency on their stuff. Thirdly, it comes with these two weird buttons. They're called super buttons, and they're really quite large. Now, the, you're taken aback when you see these, but I think that they're, they're quite useful because they can be configured without software to do whatever you want. So I'm thinking if you're playing a game where you have an emergency get-out-of-trouble button. Now, I, I, I struggle to use these buttons. I'm thinking 1942, for example, the barrel roll. I'm thinking I'm playing that. What I want to do is be able to reach out and slap something, kind of like, ah, get me out of trouble or a pinball tilt button 
Yeah, just to be clear about these buttons, they are massive. Like yeah. they are, they are big red buttons which are detached from the keyboard and yeah. sit next yeah. to the, to the keyboard, and it's about half the height of the keyboard in itself. Just one of the buttons. Um, it's an odd thing to add. I, I guess it's a nod to the Famicom controller or something. <laughs> I, I guess so, but you get them. You don't have to use them. I mean, don't use them if you don't want them. They're included in the price. And I, I think you can find a use for them. I think if you've got, I think if you've got a game like 1942 with the Barrel Rogue and on and Mister, then I'm going to put that in so I can bang, slap it, and roll when I when I when I want to to get out of trouble. Looks to me like a it almost looks like a, a telephone coupler for an early modem or um, <laughs> oh, right. or something to do Morse code with. I, it's, it's very odd. Is it optional the button? Or does it just come with it? Yeah. It comes with it. Uh, okay. I don't use them. Just stick them, stick them, back, stick them back in the box, Neil, if you don't want them. Um, fourth, the switches can be changed. So as far as I can see, you can swap them out for something different. So I might, for example, decide that I don't like the switches. I want something with a, a different travel distance or something like that with them. So I might switch them out to something more similar to Cherry MX Brown if I didn't get on with them rather than put the keyboard away and not use it at all. And fifth, it works wired and wireless. Now, I'm not a fan of wireless, uh, anytime something goes wrong and I'm using wireless, I think, is it the wireless part? Um, but I can't see a problem with the idea of being able to pull it away to use or even, and this is relevant to me, putting it up somewhere high without a cable dangling. I put it up on top of a shelf so that I can bring it down when I want to use it, but otherwise it's not on the desk. Um, now it comes in two colour schemes. They've got the N colour scheme and they've got the FAMI colour scheme which are to mimic Nintendo and Famicom colours. I don't like the Nintendo colour scheme. It, it, it looks, it, it looks, doesn't look right to me. Is that the um, grey and the and the white yeah, one that you're not liking? It, it, yeah. it, it, it is the right Nintendo colours, of course, but I don't like how it looks. The Famicom, on the other hand, I thought looked great. I thought that's what I would go for. I was, I was getting it. Neil, what do you think? You fancy it? Oh, well, yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the red, the gold, and the white of the Famicom one is is lovely um and they've got some lovely promo shots of it sat next to for example early game and watches and the original famicom and that looks nice um i guess you've then got to think about what you're going to plug it into what will look nicest next to your pc or, or well it's it going to go into it? my mister um that, that that's that's where it would go for me oh, and mister that's a good uh, idea. because you do need a keyboard for mister lots of times i i i've i've always got a keyboard plugged into it but I've got a great, but I've tried little, tiny, little kind of handheld keyboards that are a nuisance, and I've tried, um, I, I've got horrible keyboards to type on that are these kind of, the, these wireless ones, you ones you get for 20 quid off Amazon, they're rotten, and I've tried full-size USB keyboards, and they're just too big for, for the setup, so this would be ideal for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it looks great. Um it's not the only uh, it's not the only kid on the block because you remember Simulant had their Amiga mechanical keyboard a while back the uh, the white mm. one. Uh, I have now seen that privately working with an actual Amiga, so they've got that because you could swap yeah. out the USB cable for an actual cable to go straight into a, a DIN socket on an Amiga. Yeah, so um, it's not going USB to it's not going keyboard to USB to USB to Amiga. It's going okay. straight from keyboard to Amiga, which is great. So nice. that's working, and then also coming out soon from Simulant is the CD32 styled the black keyboard, which is really nice. So you've got options there as well, USB, not USB, as well as some people do keycaps that you can put on. And I find it a particularly interesting topic because uh, when I moved to the cave, I quickly found out just five minutes drive away from the cave is a, a keyboard um, seller manufacturer i don't think they're a manufacturer i think they're just a reseller of a lot of different brands and they've got a lot of keycaps and things like that and i did have early conversations with them where i said i think you could do really well if you started doing for example amstrad cpc color themed keycaps or cd32 or things like this this was all before i knew about simulants offering and other people doing this and they seemed interested but it just kind of fizzled out and i thought well i've i've suggested the idea to them if, if they want to run with it you know go for it um, and nothing came of that. But now I see what um, 8 bit Doe have come up with. It, it's not just a stock keyboard with different colored keycaps on. They have produced something quite nice, quite new. You've got a couple of dials at the top left. What are they for? Perhaps volume or something like that. I'm sure you can map them to other things. Um, 
so they, they've really stylized it well beyond just slapping some different colored keycaps on so all credit to them for doing that and also they do have a history of products that um are well made and work well and are good value for money and i think for the price when you look at the cost of other mechanical keyboards just go on amazon and see what you can pick up a generic mechanical keyboard for it's going to be around about this price if not more so yeah i i I, i'm struggling to find any negatives with this i really like it i like that the famicom one also has the um the japanese symbols on the keys you've got your you know our alphabet on there but you've also got underneath that in black the japanese symbols um the massive buttons that you can slap they're kind of growing on me (laughs) slowly (laughs) Yeah, yeah like not it. so much for the appearance, but for the utility of it. There are games, it's okay if you've got a jump button, you've got a fire button, you're using those all the time. But if you've got the kind of emergency button, then bang, ideal. You could map that to like switch back to your spreadsheet at work if you're using it at work. Yeah, the boss oh, button. The boss key. I think they used to yeah, call it the boss, boss key. Didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, that's really cool. I love the look of it. And of course, 8 Bit Doe will be producing this in large numbers just that's just the way they roll which is probably what helps them to get down to that price point as well so all good i think it's a great thing um yeah chris you don't like spending well enough five on a keyboard could you be convinced so the I, man I, who threw out his ibm keyboards yeah <laughs> yeah they were free. Um, yeah they were free so there you go that's why i threw them out if they're expensive you'd have kept them right dave Ooh, um yeah. now I, I absolutely I'm love retro them. Who wipes so, a keyboard? Don't wipe the keyboard. Just don't wipe it, it. Out. Throw it out. Get another one. Yeah. No, I love retro stream keyboards. I think they're fantastic. And if there's a market for it, which clearly there is, then then this is a great thing. And of course, Nintendo have got a massive following. And even you know, current gen gamers like the look of the old stuff, and they get the whole tie in. Um, so I, I see there's a massive market for this, and these look absolutely fantastic. No, I'm not buying one. Um, I'm more interested in keyboards that look like old machines, like you know the Amiga or the Spectrum or the Amstrad, as we've spoken about already and no i've not bought any of those either um so yeah that's me <laughs> just too tight dave too tight i do have one of those old um bluetooth zx spectrum keyboards kicking around the cave which is just i mean it looks very much like i well identical to an original zx spectrum yeah. with a dead flesh keyboard and it connects by a bluetooth why, <laughs> why? well they were, the they were made i mean yeah they were they, they, they brought those out to link up with the emulator, really, didn't they? It was yeah. So you could use yeah. an emulator and yeah. get the tactile experience. So I get that. You're not going to use it to do your, your spreadsheets, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Although yeah, I think... It does feel... It does, you know, these things do add an element to emulation. They do yeah. make it feel a bit more um, realistic and you can convince yourself that you are using the original machine. But in this instance, this keyboard never existed in the first place. It's just a, a retro feel to it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So... For me, um, I have a Mr. Setup, which I don't use for microcomputers. I use for for arcade games, and I will eventually use at some point for consoles, but when I get around to playing the games I want to play on those. So <clears throat> it's ideal for me, but also because there's, there's a real shortage of space up that end of the room, and there is a... There is a shelf that I can sit the keyboard on top of. I can reach up and get it from above my head, bring it down and plug it in when I want to. Ideal for that, so I bought one. It cost me $109 shipped to me in the UK. That's all it cost. It comes from China. So um, not expensive that way. $109, I felt was a bargain. Um, so it's going into my Mr. Setup. Uh, I hope that the volume control works in Mr. I'm not expecting that it will. Uh, but hopefully once these are once these have come out and people are using them more often someone will integrate support in it for the volume to there but i'll be hoping to play 1942 and slapping the button to do a barrel roll when i need to because I, I, I play 1942 i'm not very good at it i love the game i'm not very good at it but i need to be able to hit that barrel roll because i don't do it in game i've never been able to to get into the habit of oh remember to do that and where's the button for it so that's what i'm going to do but um, you cannot take my numeric keypad away in other circumstances. I'm keeping that. You can pre-order it now. It's coming out in, in September. Uh, I think that I can't remember the date in September. It's coming out in September. They'll pre-order now. You'll get it maybe the beginning of October. 
Dave, I know you're currently building an Amiga 1200 uh, with a fine choice of an O3O ready to go as well. And the Amiga 1200 being an AGA-based machine, of course, what are you planning on playing on it? Well, I want to look most at Amiga games that come around the time and after I switch to DOS. Um, the DOS period, I've said, is, is magnificent for games, but the Amiga has some highlights too. Um, around 89, 90, developers started to use the Amiga properly. Um, not a huge amount back then, but it, it started to, to gather uh, momentum. And uh, eventually, games started to come out for the Amiga that were designed for the Amiga rather than designed in the ST and Porter or designed with both in mind, so kind of held back a bit. Uh, so things like uh, Hybris and Menace are early examples. Hybris is Amiga only. Menace is not so good on the ST compared to the Amiga. Uh, clearly, Menace, I feel Menace was, was designed by DMA for the Amiga, and then they said, okay, what can we do for the ST? <clears throat> so... For me, the Amiga period, as far as I'm concerned, isn't really in the 80s, not the late 80s. It starts kind of in the 90s. That's the Amiga period for me, and that's what I want to look at. So I want to look at um, games that came out for the Amiga, not for the ST. There are some RPGs as well. Uh, we talked about the four Amber Moon, et cetera. Um, that's, um, some of those come out for the ST, but mainly it's, a, it's an Amiga game. So I want to look at those. Um, but for me, I, I'm not, People talk about the ST and Amiga conflict, and we have a bit of a a chat about it. But it's not. I don't really believe much in it. Uh, I think for me, the ST came first, the Amiga came after, and there's not so much of a crossover there. Neil, argue with me. No, I was just going to say you you want to dip into that period after you switch to DOS, mm. but you're not exclusively looking for AGA games, are you? Because no, no, you know, no, that, that AGA is really restrict you. <laughs> I've always yeah, said that the, the, the Amiga 1200 to me seems like the best way to play Amiga 500 games. Uh, well, I'd say the Amiga 600 because it's cheaper. <laughs> but anyway, well, you've, yeah, already, okay. you've already begun. You've already begun. So yeah. it's still a fine machine and it at least gives you access to the AGA games as well, yeah. of which there are not many. And on that, I mean, Neil, if, if there was a game that you would think is a good game to show people what the AGA chipset can do, any recommendations, Neil? Um, I would say Dave should try Sheep Shaver. Which is, uh, or Shiva. which is an Apple Macintosh emulator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. <clears throat> Why have they called oh, it Sheep Shaver? Um, there's probably something behind that. It, it evolved out of the Basilisk emulator before that, but I don't know why it was called Sheep Shaver. Um, hmm. No, th th there are some well-known AGA options, such as, you know, Zool has more backgrounds and more colors and things like that. Um, one I quite like, and I think you'll like, because I know you're a fan of, of Laser Squad and XCOM and games mm -hmm. like that, is Saber Team, which was out on the regular Amigas, but then it did get um, an AGA release a year or so after the original release with some bug fixes and just a all round nicer, well-rounded version of the game. So Sabre Team would be my pick for you. I will eventually play that then. I'll take your word for it. Nice. Well, the reason I ask the questions is because, um, well, when I got my hands on an A1200 eventually and also the CD32, I asked around in the communities as I really wanted to see something that would wow me over what I was already used to with the Amiga 500. And the title that came up again and again was Banshee, which I've got a copy of here. It's the floppy disk version for the A1200. Um, so there you go, Banshee in the box. Love it. It's another go-to, really, isn't it? When it comes to AGA yeah. games, people go, try Banshee. You gotta try Everybody Banshee. says try Banshee, absolutely. Um, and if you're not familiar with the game, it's a vertical scrolling shooter in which you control what looks like a World War II-era prop-driven fighter plane against wave after wave of increasingly technologically advanced enemies. And it's actually a wonderful shooter. It's fast-paced, it's got very little lag, and it's got some really nice atmospheric weather effects and stuff like that. Um, and it's got a bit of a steampunk aesthetic to it as well. But it didn't wow me. Um, I just wasn't seeing the huge gap in this prime example of, a, of an AGA-era game and um, what I'd come from in the Amiga 500. And the reason can be summed up in one word, SWIV, which I've also got here, funnily enough. And I've got the poster behind me. And I've, I'm even wearing the badge because this was a complete box. A Banshee came out in 1994, which um, on the, you know, in the, in the context of uh, vertical scrolling shooters, um, probably starting to feel like a little bit of a, a creaky um, genre at the time because mm. it kind of moved from 
first you know uh, scrolling shooters in arcades being premium you know triple a games to um then feeling a bit old to then like being this real sort of specialist niche that people really got into and bullet hell bullet and hell. all of that yeah. sort of stuff um so it kind of it's been through a few um it's phases reasons. in its life hasn't it vertical shooters and i think yeah. banshee is a good one but 1994 it just sort of falls into that slot of disinterest for the yeah. genre whereas swift was earlier than that wasn't it yeah it was yeah um i, I mean that, and that's the whole thing for me you know i was looking for something that was really going to show off the aga and so you play banshee and literally it was in the back of my mind it was swiv um that, that was sort of the comparison for me dave is um, maybe the, the amiga purists are gonna crucify me for this but is it not the case that ag isn't really that great that the original Amiga is pretty good, and EGA was a step back from what they really wanted to do, and it's it's not really that good compared. It's not that really that much of a step forward, so that's why you're not seeing the difference. Um, uh, Neil, it's not. Uh, uh, wrong? Sorry, uh, no, AGA is is not what was wanted and not the original vision for the next generation of Amiga. You're right; it was a a cut down. Um, version of their vision to just get something out there um so it's so still the ombre, based it, on the... bit planes rather than you know um although although the, the cd32 did have the akiko chip to to help with the uh the, the bitmap graphics um so it still had the same drawbacks uh carried mm. over from the older chipset just with more colors really <laughs> and right a couple, i yeah. think i had a couple more resolutions to play with so um, it wasn't yeah. really a, 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 a revolution and it wasn't really a next, next generation it was just a an iteration then again to use that word <clears throat> yeah i mean i yeah. guess its competition was going to be vga wasn't it that's what it wanted to yeah. compete with so it, it right. brought it up to those colors um and plus they were full 32-bit machines rather than 16-bit which for the original amigas were 16-bit so mm. you got that as well. But so you got the more colors and that stuff, sort of stuff. But the point I'm slowly, really slowly creaking towards is is the <laughs> fact that, you, and you've touched on it there, Dave, it's not so much that Banshee is a bad game and a bad example of what the AGA can do. It's that, A, the Amiga 500 was so good, but Swiv in particular was just fantastic at the tricks that it pulled. Um, and it's it's got a really good following. And it's not certainly not just me that thinks very highly of Swiv. Um, and you know why I wasn't seeing that wow factor is because Swiv has done so well. And so there's basically a story on Eurogamer.net uh, by Graham Mason uh, and shared with us by a user called Christoph Why Do You uh, <laughs> on the subreddit. And it, no, it's not me. Um, and it goes into great detail on what made Swiv such a great game. Um, the article has insightful input from Jane Kavanagh, who formed the publisher The Sales Curve, later known as SCI Entertainment, who were involved in Swiv's inception as an official, uh, sorry, an unofficial spiritual successor to Silkworm, uh, and used the same team who'd made the home ports of the original to create Swiv. Um, uh, that team was, of course, named Random Access. It talks about the success of the home ports of Silkworm and the inspirations behind Swiv, but it also goes into more about what made Swiv so special for its time, including, and I've just picked a few key points here, uh, the fact that the level editor that they used in the game's development was sprite-based rather than using tile mapping, and the fact that, and, and you realise this when you play the game, but actually it's it's so well done that you miss it. The game, so Swiv, is one continuous level uh, with a changing palette. So you get a really good look and feel, a, a change in look and feel. So it looks like the Amiga's kind of punching out more colors than it needs to because they literally change the palette as it scrolls from one level to the other seamlessly. And they, they actually created their own dynamic sort of level um, system to do that. Really cleverly done. And you don't notice any load time or anything as it's happening when you're playing the game. Uh, and it also has adaptive difficulty. So almost like what we'd refer to as rubber banding um, in terms of, you know, the longer you're alive, the more the game starts to throw at you. And then when you eventually die, then it will sort of scale back the difficulty for a time period as well. So really, really cool dynamics. Um, 
What it doesn't really touch on is the soundscape. I, I didn't see anything written about this in the article, and I, I really want to mention that as well because it's 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 a really cool aspect of the game uh, that is so special in my eyes. Everything just has the perfect weight to it is how, how I explain it. There's a real cause and effect between what you do as a player and what happens in the game, both both visually but also audibly. You know, just the right sounds for explosions and bullet sound effects and, and pickups and, and, and everything you do in the game. So, yep, let's open it up. Uh, guys, what are your thoughts on Swiv? And what would you say is your favorite vertical scrolling shooter on any system or even in the arcade? Neil? Well, uh, just to pick you up on your your love of the audio in the game, um, if anyone wants some light reading, I'm currently reading this book, which is Understanding Video Game Music by Tim Summers with a foreword by James Hannigan, who uh, I believe listens to our show sometimes. Hello, James, if you're listening. Um, so, yes, look that one up, Understanding Video Game Music. Anyway, um, Swiv, <laughs> Understanding. Um I have said quite a few times in the past that I enjoy Silkworm better than Swiv, but on reflection, that is just because of personal nostalgia. Um, Swiv was not made for the arcade. It was made for the home systems first, which I think fundamentally makes it a deeper game um, with a lot more to, to get your teeth into. It was made for the home players, so not, not to gobble up your coins. So um, I do have a lot of respect for Swiv and I do enjoy it. I just I just think I enjoyed the the side view more than the top down. I I don't know why. Um, and nostalgia as well, being as there was a Silkworm arcade close to me when I grew up that I played a lot. So um, I'm not a big shoot 'em up fan. So you asked for games that I do enjoy. Uh, again, I lean towards those I'm nostalgic for, like Silkworm. Not necessarily those the uh, the um, the experts of the genre love. Um, so games for me include Gemini wing arcade and Amiga. Um, we've got it in the arcade archive. Now it's, I, I really do enjoy playing it down there. Uh, Raiden, because, um, when I bought my first arcade cabinet way back, that was the board that was in there originally didn't come with the board, but it had a marquee and I was able to then emulate it and, and enjoy it again. Got into that. 1942, like Dave uh, mentioned earlier when we were talking about the keyboard with his emergency button to get out the game or barrel roll. Um, Aero Fighters, that was a good series um, in the arcade. And then on the Amiga Battle Squadron, and yes, for all the hate it gets, Xenon 2, purely for the nostalgia. You know, load it up, have the music play on the intro sequence, remind yourself how bad it is. 1942 is mine. I said before, I love 1942 in the arcade. Never very really good at it. It's very frustrating because I make mistakes and I get angry at the mistakes I make, but I do love playing it. Um, and I know, like Neil, I like Zenon 2. I know people love to criticize Zenon 2, and the criticism is valid. However, when I loaded Zenon 2 for the first time on my Atari ST, it blew me away. It was the first full on kind of bombastic, full. 16-bit experience that I'd seen uh, on the ST that was it, it just better than anything else I'd seen before. And the gameplay was good enough. Certainly not perfect, but it was good enough to carry the hype that came with the game to make it an enjoyable game that I played a lot. Uh, now, Swib was a, out a bit late for me. By 1991, I had pretty much stopped playing anything other than strategy and role-playing games. Um, not because I disliked other things, but because there just wasn't enough time in the day and that's what was there and that's what I wanted to play. So I played those. Um, and um, I'm ashamed to say that the type of games like Swiv and so on, I would get on pirate disc compilations. I would load them up with the trainers on. I would play them for five or ten minutes to see as much of the game as I could in that, in that period of time, and then I would move on. Um so these days I, I don't do that. These days I don't cheat in the games. There's no point. Um, but back then I, I just wanted to 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 get as much out of that that disc as I could in five or ten minutes, and then get back to Populous Two or uh, Ultima Six or whatever. Um, I have seen it though in recent years, and it's one I, I will come to. The ST version is okay, um, but I've not played it in the ST, and I may as well play it on the Amiga. The Amiga version looks better, um, but so I will come to Swiv. Uh, I did play Saltworm a little bit in the arcade. I think it's a great two-player game, um, but uh, yeah. Has anyone played Swiv on the eight-bit systems? Because I've, I've no. honest, to be honest, I've only played it on the Amiga. Mm. Yeah, I'm curious game. though, because it's even out on the spectrum, isn't it? 
Hmm. I don't think they use quite as many colours on the spectrum. So I'll tell you what I it's out think... on. Uh, Amiga, Atari ST, Acorn Archimedes, probably good on that. ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, Commodore 64, MSX, Game Boy Color. Ooh. It may be okay go. in the Game Boy Color. Some of the conversions on that on that platform are really good. Yeah. And clever what they've done with them. Um, but the, the CPC in 1991, that was a bit long in the tooth. Just a bit. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Other contenders for shooters for me, well, actually, another version of Civ, so Swi- Swiv, sorry, Super Swiv on the SNES. That's quite a good port. Um, the Amiga is my favorite because that's the first one I played and my preference, but the SNES version is very good as well. Um, Swiv, Swiv 3D, not going to get a mention in the honorable. I've never list. played Swiv 3D. Okay. No, I've never yeah. actually. Uh, now that you've mentioned it, I will have to look that so up. Fancy because, it. No, I'll have to look it up, though. I'll have to give it a go. Um, it says that one of these, we have to go 3D and here's the best we can manage. It's not very really good. Just like Thanks. Worms, the excellent Worms. I know everybody loves that. One of my favorite games. Yeah, Worms no, 3D. Swift 3D rate w- was reviewed pretty well. Um, was it? You know, what system's yeah. that on? Uh, it's on In the what PC, way is it so 3D? Te- well, techno- it's voxel-based and technology-wise, it, it sort of felt Oh, that's like, okay. You know, it was somewhere between zarch and magic carpet kind of feeling of a, you know, yeah. outside the helicopter flying around. Certainly wasn't a flight sim. You know, still an arcade action game. I don't know how it holds up today, but in its time, it, it reviewed well in '96. It's on GOG. All right, that's getting a download. Okay, <laughs> so Swift, and maybe soon Swift 3D. Um, but in terms of vertical scrollers, Hybris, yeah, as Dave mentioned, that's just such a fantastic game. Battle Squadrons, which was done m- mostly by the same team, I believe. Um, another awesome one. And of course, you've got two player in that as well. Flying Shark, which for me was, I know that's a popular game, but not usually on the spectrum. And that's the version I played, so that's the version I love. Dragon Spirit, I love simply because it's so different. It's not, again, I played it on the Amiga. I believe it was an arcade originally. So probably try the arcade. The Amiga port's a bit laggy, um, but I just love the concept. It's a vertical scrolling shooter, but you're controlling a, a dragon. I mean, that's awesome. You know, rather than a spaceship or a helicopter or a tank or whatever. Um, and it's a bit of a cheat, but I'm going to throw it on the list. Spy Hunter. That's a vertical scrolling shoot em up. Oh, so does that count? It's, That's a yes, it's game. on the list. It's yeah, it's, it's on the list. It's you on know, the list. Like, I'm throwing like it on me, there. It's like me trying to put Commando <laughs> in the list. Does it scroll <laughs> vertically? My favorite is hard driving. You go for hard definitely. driving. <laughs> hard driving is a fantastic point and click adventure. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Super fast boom when you're driving straight up and down. Yeah, only, only when you're driving up and down. <laughs> But anyway, on Swiv, and I love a Swiv, do check out the original story by Graham Mason as it's well worth a read and has some cameo quotes as well from developers Ron Pikett and Ned Langman. Uh, link in the show notes. Time now for our community question of the week, and it's the moment I asked Dave, have you locked the thread, Dave? Take it out of contest mode. It didn't need done. It was it was not in contest mode to start off with. I don't oh, know why. We're good, aren't we? We're um, good. I'll have, I'll have to, to chat with Duncan and make sure we get our uh, thoughts aligned on with this so it's ready to very go. serious okay i hope i haven't got you in trouble duncan yes chris no Wait, no, no i'm no, sorry no, i'm all. sorry we got we got we're going into housekeeping already because swift 3d is not actually on gog it's on the wish list people want it to happen uh, and it hasn't. so okay. there we go okay back to question of the week <laughs> okay so um last week we were talking about this environmental uh, tron that was found left out in the trash for the bin men. Uh, and we asked the question of you, you spy something awesome and retro in your neighbor's bin or just left by the side of the road. What is that dream something? What do you dream of just spotting on the side of the road and you would leap out of your car to collect? Um, let's go and have a look. I will pick the first one. Top answer comes from... Are we still in contest mode? Prefim. No, we've checked that. It's all good. Okay. Oh, no, it does. No, it does. Um, it says it's in contest mode. It says mode. this post has contest mode enabled. That's weird. When I looked there, it said sort by best. Honestly, well, pointing let me fix the this. finger I'm entirely Duncan. wrong. Entirely wrong. Poor entirely Duncan. wrong. Why is, it, why is it showing best in one view in contest mode and the other? Shall I contest turn contest mode, mode off? I don't know. Yeah, I'm... turn contest mode right. off. That's all you need to do. I End. Contest that. is ended. Right, so I'll now refresh. And refresh, and then the top answer is still Prefim. <laughs> and um, Prefim says, Sam K- Sam Coupe computer with all the keys and dual drives fitted. So rare these days. But it was the stepping stone from the ZX Spectrum towards machines like the Amiga for me. Um, 
I'm as big a fan of the Sam Coupe as anyone else. I'm not sure how much of a stepping stone it was because the Amiga was already out at the point when the Sam Coupe came out, which was, um, what, 1989, was it? I'll have to double check that. Um, yeah, I, I noticed though. Yeah, 89. He must be talking about for him, though. It must be talking His own about personal for him. experience. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. So if that was the stepping stone, then I see that you've got a little bit more. Uh, than the ZX Spectrum is capable of with the backwards compatibility, but it just mm. teases you with its native software with what it could do. Uh, and then on, onwards then to 16-bit machines. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Such a good-looking computer. Who wants to take the next one? In fact, we yeah, do a okay. few because we, we have got it's some a short, short answers. One. Yeah, yeah, the next one's Marion Bala, um, a working Atari Falcon. And that's been followed up by somebody else saying, hell, a broken Falcon, Otrio. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep, I'd go with that. I mean, Our friend Richard says, Richard here says, oh, for me, it would be the CDTV, even though as Commodore would have you believe it's not an Amiga 500, he says in brackets, it is. <laughs> I was always drawn by its looks, particularly in its later adverts with the black matching monitor and floppy drive. I could never bring myself to part with my hard, hard-earned paper money round to get one at current prices, knowing that it lacks any real killer app and everything it does can be achieved on one of my multiple Amigas. But I can picture the black beauty accented nicely next to the red highlights of Elmo. <laughs> anyway, I'll shut up now as I need to go and rummage through my neighbor's bins. Very good. Get one, um, Rich. Get one. Couple more. Tasted a murder says, I can imagine the folk at the mill having grown tired of their building, land, and all the delights within. Fly tip it on my curbside. While no one is watching, I quickly drag it into my property. It snaps into place at the edge of my garden as if it belonged there the whole time. Failing that, a Space Invaders arcade cabinet in mint condition. Just needs a wipe down with a damp cloth. <laughs> Um, yeah, don't I don't think I'm going to dump the contents of the mill anytime soon, but uh, you're top of the list now, if it happens. Penny Arcade. Pachaco wants a Penny Arcade machine. Biscuit, a Sinclair C5. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Battle Pratt's looking for a boxed Vectrex. Uh, Mogway, an Acorn Archimedes A3000. Uh, Antiques of a Geeks just simply wants a working zip drive and some discs. <laughs> he knows what he wants. They, they click, don't they? Is that the ones that click? Uh, the the 100 meg ones, yeah, have the click of death, but I had a very trusty, reliable 100 meg one back in the day. Never suffered it myself. Mm. Um, but it's obviously a thing because lots of people talk about it. Um, Warshi, Gianna Sisters for the C64 tape version. That was the one that was pulled from the shelves not long after release, so it was very collectible. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, mm. what, was, what, was this? what was it similar to? Oh, it was Nintendo throwing its weight around again. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, it's not as if Nintendo were in the wrong here. I mean, it was just a rip-off. Yeah, absolutely. So we go. Thank you to everyone who took part in our question of the week. And we have another question of the week for you this week. Head over to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro to take part. And the question is, tell us about your relationship with CRTs. Have you moved on to flat screens for use with your retro system? Are you sitting on a stockpile of Trinitrons to last the rest of your lifetime? Are you a CRT snob? Or are you happy to use whatever you get your hands on? Did we move on from CRTs for a reason? And does the nostalgia for them simply confuse you? So basically, tell us about your display preference with your retro computers. Yeah, yeah. Don't get it wrong, though. This is the Thank most you. exciting question we've had since the printer one. It's up there with printers. <laughs> right up there. With I think printers. we'll get some I think we'll get some interesting responses here. I, I think really so. think we'll do because there's a there's some aspects of the CRT thing that I think people like that I think are bad. I mean there's lots of reasons why CRTs were bad. Um so uh, yeah, interesting. Mm, will be there we go. We look forward to seeing your answers. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen or watch however you choose to consume the show. Please do take a moment to subscribe if you haven't already done so. Head over to patreon.com forward slash this week in retro if you'd like to support the production of the show. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye bye. Give us a review. Go and give us a review bye. right now. Bye bye. Bye. Write a review in Pixel Attic magazine. Bye. I'm waving. Chris is waving. Oh, Neil's oh, not waving. I'm waving. Neil's waving now. There we go. Neil's waving. <laughs>
podcast version of the show is available to your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.